Very warm welcome to Talking Germany, the show where we do just that. And our guest in the studio today is a spaceman, no less. No ordinary spaceman either, because he spent more time in space than anybody except the leading Russians and Americans. In fact, 350 days in space. So without any further ado, let's meet Thomas Reiter. Thomas, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Hello, Peter. First question, there are certain experiences in life, without a doubt, that fundamentally change people. They make them a different kind of person. Is going into space that kind of experience? I definitely think so, yes. I don't know if I really changed. At least my wife tells me and my <laughs> friends I'm still the same guy. Nevertheless, uh, those experiences from uh, seeing our beautiful planet, looking to the starry sky uh, above the atmosphere is something that uh, follows me, I'm sure, till the end of my life. How? Does it, make, does it make you more, you know, the other people are looking at you, they're saying you haven't changed, but you're convinced you have. Does it make you more philosophical? <laughs> yes, um, indeed. Uh, I think the way I'm looking at uh, things that happen here on Earth is uh, slightly changed. It always is with the background that I had the chance to uh, oversee whole continents mm -hmm. and uh, being so impressed by the beauty of our planet, uh, knowing that, of course, here on Earth, nothing is really perfect, at least not a lot. Um, and uh, this comes always back, not at every moment in life, but uh, sometimes watching the news, reading the newspapers, just ordinary situations in daily life where, uh, for example, you get a little bit uh, pushy when there is a long line, and then I say, well, this is really nonsense. Why, why do you care about that? There's so many important things to do here on this Earth and in space. Thomas Reiter has put aside his spacesuit. We have just learned it. It's interesting that because there is a well-known internet site that I was reading. I'm not going to tell you who it was, but I'm sure you can guess. Uh, they describe you as a retired astronaut. Is that fair and square? Is that right? Well, um, do, do astronauts ever retire? Not really. <laughs> uh, not really. At least from their soul, from their intention, from their passion for spaceflight, they never retire. Uh, there is a little bit of truth to it, of course, because uh, now I'm flying a desk and it's not very likely that I uh, will have the chance to go back into space. Nevertheless, uh, my boss knows if he asks me which answer he will get. <laughs> Okay, let's just go back a little bit in time. Thomas Reiter, that's you, towards the end of your career as an astronaut in space. The 11-year-old Thomas Reiter, we have just learned, sat and watched the moon landing. Yes. Can you just describe that for us yeah. a little bit more, your feelings there? Well, this time was, of course, very, very, uh, had a big influence on me because at that time my, my wish, my dream was born to become an astro astronaut eventually. So you, you were already set to become an astronaut? I, well, <laughs> as, as much as you can be uh, in this state with the age of 11. Mm -hmm. uh, with 11 years, I followed uh, all these activities, the spaceflight activities uh, of NASA, the Gemini program, the Apollo program, and then the first landing, Apollo 11, Neil Armstrong, uh, Buzz Aldrin. And something that still... Um, fascinates me today is the feeling you might have when you stand with your own feet on the surface of another planet. Sure, yeah. Is it good? You, you had a dream and the dream came true. Is that a, a good thing in life? Definitely, yes. I, I would have never hoped that this would happen and I have to say it was somehow by chance. In Europe, uh, the chance to become an astronaut is not too good, uh, I thought, and that's uh, why I uh, chose another direction and uh, I, I studied aerospace technology, joined the uh, armed forces, became military pilot, test pilot, and that was uh, also a very, very interesting path. Uh, and then uh, one afternoon I was coming back from a flight, I, wa I was asked by my um, by my superior if I would like to participate in a, in a selection program for astronauts. I didn't have to think twice. 
And it all led to that incredible moment. We were just talking about it yes. while the report was running, where that door opens. Yes. Just describe what you felt then. Um, You're already taking a deep <laughs> breath. <laughs> yes, it's, um, the, the view of our planet is, is something that fascinates, and it compensates the difficult life on board a space station. I mean, you have very limited space, even you are in space, but uh, the work on board a space station, every minute is pre-planned, almost every second. And this beautiful view of our, uh, of our planet, being able to look over whole continents, mm. um, to be uh, to take only 90 minutes uh, one time around the whole planet and on the night side to see the d the starry sky to see the moon very clearly this um, is very very rewarding very unique and i can assure you i've talked about this a lot of times but i just don't find the right words for it it no. is fascinating and maybe it's good that it's not possible to put that all concrete in words. But we can sense it. I can sense how you are marvelling still about it all. It was interesting what you were just saying about it being a very controlled environment. I'd like to talk about that in just a little bit. But first of all, tell me this. Uh, the space race is still on. It hasn't finished. There are planets to be visited. There are, you know, distant planets that we want to find out more about. Is Germany a significant player in this space race? Well, it definitely is. Um, I would like to uh, modify a little bit uh, what you said, that the space race is still on. To a certain extent, I agree, but uh, we have to... Um uh, to acknowledge that today um, it's much broader cooperation. Yes, there are still there is still competition, and we know competition is good because we we are driven to give our best. But uh, fortunately, space is an area where people also cooperate. The International Space Station is a, is a good example for it. Germany, I think, has uh, excellent assets in the area of uh, science and technology, and DLR, of course, is contributing to it. Also, other scientific centers, but um, I think in the areas of Earth observation, communication, navigation, space technology and science, we are good players worldwide. Thomas Reich, I think it is fair to say that there is a, f a, a good deal of scepticism in Germany still about qualifications from other countries. Mm -hmm. Is that in any way justified? Well, um, deep sigh. <laughs> I, I, I think that um, uh, from uh, the uh, messages I get from my institute heads, uh, who have uh, indeed some problems to get qualified personnel uh, for the research they are doing, um, it is necessary to open a little bit more to uh, um, specialists beyond. Germany without any doubt and I think the past has shown that indeed we have uh, very good experiences and um, uh, especially in uh, uh, respect to uh, space flight I can tell that uh, we heard here there were some engineers from Russia um, now uh, trying to get the qualifications here in Germany there is a, in, in really a lot we can learn from them mm -hmm. We have, the, 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 let's say, the German engineers have a tendency to be perfectionists, mm. which is okay, but um, I saw on the Russian side, they are very pragmatic. And I think the optimum combination is to get this, uh, this practicism and, and the drive for perfection together in a nice combination so we can really learn and take advantage of uh, those people coming from other countries. One reason why Germany doesn't have enough of the people that we're talking about here is because young Germans aren't, certainly in the numbers that would be required, interested in the science is not enough. That must have you tearing your hair out. <laughs> <laughs> Almost. I uh, do my best and also my colleagues, my astronaut colleagues also in DLR, uh, quite a lot of people um, who are talking about space flight. I mean, apart from all the science and the technology that is related to spaceflight, it is still fascinating. Mm -hmm. And um, if we manage to fascinate young people, um, we know not everyone can become an astronaut and fly to space. But if, le if we can at least ignite them, if we can uh, uh, make them... Uh, uh, let's say, grow their passion for mm. space. Get that them excited. Can be, that, that yeah. can be a big driver to decide afterwards to study um, sign, scientific uh, subject or engineering sure. subject and then uh, work in this direction. I just had you tearing your hair out. Let's go back to hair. I've got some video. We've got some video that we would like uh, our viewers to share with us or to share with them. Just co tell me what's going on here, Thomas. Yeah, of course, on, on board the space station, we need to uh, cut our hair every once in a while. At least Yuri on the right side uh, mm -hmm. and, and myself on the bottom. Sergei, uh, who is now floating uh, on 
top of me. He he has a little bit longer hair. His uh, wife uh, clearly told us that we should not <laughs> cut his hair too short. But uh, you can imagine in, in weightlessness, the hair is not falling down. So we need to use this vacuum cleaner uh, to uh, to clear uh, the hair that we are cutting off. A real state-of-the-art pair of scissors. <laughs> state-of-the-art yeah, well, vacuum cleaner indeed. It yeah? worked, it worked. Listen, you put four people in a car and they go on a car journey. Day one, everybody's really happy. Day two, people begin to get on each other's nerves. Yeah? That must happen in space. That's what I expected, but indeed it never happened that way. I have to admit, yes, there were times where, um, let's say, every one of us had uh, his blues, uh, Monday morning, you know, the, the, the work ahead of you is not always as interesting, some certain activities as others. But um, there was never this kind of friction between mm. us because we know we rely on each other, we need to work together and there was indeed a very good friendship. And I can assure you, I would never mind, I would not mind flying together with Yuri and Sergei another half year. There would be still <laughs> enough topics we could talk about in the evenings or on the weekends. <laughs> Thomas, was it giving me one example of how you deal with, how you dispose with trash in space? Yes, we, we have uh, supply spaceships, uh, the Russian Progress uh, spaceship, and since last year also a European uh, supply spaceship, the ATV, Automated Transfer Vehicle. Now, once these spaceships are unloaded, uh, they supply the station with food, with uh, water, with uh, oxygen, with uh, spare parts, with scientific um, equipment. Once they are unloaded, we fill them up with the trash, and then it undocks, the spaceship undocks and burns up in the upper layers of the atmosphere. So it's a very um, good uh, way of disposing trash up there. There's virtually nothing that comes down to the surface of the Earth. It's more or less environmentally friendly. Space is the environment in that case. Yes. I wanted to ask you about that. You, you, we've talked about you going up into space and looking down on planet Earth and what effect that has on you as a person, philosophically almost. Mm -hmm. um, does it make you more of an environmentalist when you look down and you see tiny little planet Earth looking so vulnerable. Definitely. Um, if you look at the atmosphere, for example, you see, we know the atmosphere is approximately 100 kilometers in altitude. Now that sounds a lot if we are sitting here on the surface of the Earth. If you look down from 400 kilometers, it looks very, very thin. You can uh, distinguish layers in different shades of blue and that looks indeed very, very vul vulnerable. Mm. There are other areas. So of course, this gives you the, the idea that we need to do something for the protection of our atmosphere, also the forests. Mm -hmm. We all know that um, we have a lot of fo forest areas on this planet, but with your bare eyes, you can see, for example, in Southern America, the areas that are uh, where the deforestation is, is continuing. And if you, you, can, you can see that physically happening in front of your naked eye through the window. Yes, yes, you see that with your naked eye. It's those like watching a glacier areas. recede. Or so. It's one it's of those something moments. Like that, yeah. And comparing my first mission now with the second mission, of course, you don't see that from one to the other day, but mm -hmm. uh, between two missions, this is really frightening. And for that reason, yes, you get a little bit closer to the nature and the necessity to protect this spaceship Earth. Mm. I don't know what your religious beliefs are, and it's not what I'm going to ask you about, but I am going to ask you a little bit about, um, I'm curious, again, this thing of seeing the planet at a distance. Does it make you more or less likely to believe in God? You know, it's um, a question of, well, my, my belief, I don't think there is a place where you can be closer to God anywhere on this planet or anywhere else. Um, there is a fascination about the creation of this nature of, of, of our planet. Nevertheless, there is a part of it uh, that I believe, but I'm maybe a little bit too much an engineer and scientist, so I always try to find a rational explanation how this could happen and um, how things are working and what uh, actually rules um, our solar system, our world, uh, the universe. We're back to the philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> um. You said in one interview I read that when you're in the ISS, you look out of the window and you see the view we've been talking about. Mm. You know, when I go on holiday and I've got a beautiful view from my terrace, wherever I am, on day one I'm fascinated, day two I'm yeah. still fascinated, 
week two, I'm getting a little bit blasé. I've got used to it. You know what I'm asking. Yes, yes. <laughs> it, it never got uh, boring uh, over this half year. And I can assure you, once I got back, mm -hmm. uh, the day after the landing, I thought, what a pity that I didn't take more time to enjoy this beautiful view. There was not a second of anything that uh, when I looked out and I said, well, okay, I've seen that. It's always slightly different. You always see it in a different context. The sun rises, the sunsets are always overwhelming um, uh, uh, fireworks of colors. And uh, for that reason, I wouldn't mind to enjoy that for a year in sequence. A great vision. We're going to finish the show. Quick questions, quick answers, talking Germany quiz time. Travelling in space, a job or an adventure? Adventure. Space programmes, a gamble or a sound investment? A sound investment. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> we saw you playing your guitar in space and I know you play badminton. Guitar or badminton racket? Guitar. The food on Mia or the food on ISS, what was better? <laughs> food on ISS. Is there life out there, yes or no? Yes. Are you going to go back to space, semi-retired spaceman? I'm afraid not. Thank you very much for speaking to us today. Thomas Reiter, uh, the guitar-playing spaceman, has been with us today. If you've enjoyed meeting him as much as I have, do come back next week.